And then we're gonna dive in to week two of the best is yet to come. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Jesus, right now, I pray that you would speak to us. God, that you would speak through me. God, that you would give me the ability to say only what you want me to say and how you want me to say it. Just help me to get out of the way. I want to be your vessel today. There are people here today that believe the best is yet has passed. They don't believe the best is yet to come. They just believe that they just should give up. And I pray that you would help them see that that is a lie from the enemy. We love you, Jesus, and we pray that you would speak right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Maybe there's something you need to give to God today. Maybe it's a fear. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a relationship. Whatever you need to give to God, you just say, God, I give it. Just name it out. I give it. If it's a fear, give it to him. Name it out. We're thankful that you hear our prayer. We love you, Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Hey, we learned last week in Easter this, that a correct, thank you, Devin. Devin, you are my number one fan. I love you. <laughs> we learned this, that without corrected vision, something dies that God wanted to live. And last week I talked about this. I talked about how th there's many of you, you don't believe that the best is yet to come. And yet something has died inside of you that God wanted to live. But you've given up. And I talked last week about how I went through a season in my life where I felt like my best days were behind me. Do you know how miserable that is? And if that's you today, I want to tell you that you can turn the corner and really believe that the best is yet to come. But without corrected vision... Something dies that God wanted to what? Live. And today I titled the message, Start with Small Steps of Obedience. Start with Small Steps of Obedience. I want to tell you a story. It's found in Numbers chapter 13. Story of Israel. They're out in the wilderness. God is trying to lead them through their leader, Moses. I mean, there is like... I can think of all the leaders in the Bible, and Moses would be one of my top leaders. I mean, that dude was bad to the bone. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and he was, Moses was trying to guide and direct them, and yet they were being stubborn, and they wouldn't listen to him, and they were always looking at their circumstances. And so Moses was trying to lead them and say, hey, I think there's this land over here called Canaan, and I think it's a great land that we should go into. And so Moses sends how many spies? Do you remember this from Sunday school? He sends 12 spies into the land, okay? And we pick it up in Numbers chapter 13, verse 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of what? Canaan and said to go up to Negeb and go up into the hill country and see what the land is, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. I mean, check it out. Kind of see what's going on in the land. See whether the land that, is, that they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities that are, they dwell in are camps or are they strongholds. See whether they are rich or poor, whether they are trees in it or not. And be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land now the time was the season of the first ripe, grape, ripe grapes. So they went up and they spied out the land. Now one thing for sure, Moses had more vision than those people. Would everybody agree with me? Moses had vision, right? Like Moses had vision and most of the children of Israel, if you read their story, they didn't have any vision they could only see today. And some of you, you can't even see today. All you can see is like the hour that you're in. Some of you, your whole life, you've never lived except just for the hour that you're in or for the day or for your next meal. And they got fearful. Now, I introduced you to a scripture last week Proverbs 29, verse 18. I'm going to read it in a couple of different translations and then a paraphrase, and we're going to talk about it for a few minutes. But Proverbs 29, 18 
It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, I, I think that's probably a poor translation. I'm gonna to try to do my best to explain this. I like what the message says. It says, if the people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. See, the way we think of vision is seeing. I wear glasses so that I can have better what? Vision, okay? I, I see what I can see is vision. Yes, that's true. Another, another way of vision, of thinking of vision, is the act of anticipating that which will or may come to be. I mean, it may or it will come to be. And then there is an experience appears vividly to the mind under the influence of a divine agency, all right? This is what Proverbs is talking about. This is, it's, it's talking about the revelation from God. And uh, I want to jump ahead in the notes so whoever's running the screen can uh, um, turn, jump, to, jump ahead to Proverbs 29, 18 in the NLT. It'll be later on in my notes. But it says, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is what? is joyful. In other words, Proverbs is saying, hey, uh, another good translation of this is uh, when people are unrestrained, I believe that people that are living in America today are unrestrained. We don't have truth that's guiding us. We're just unrestrained, doing whatever we want to do. There's nothing that is guiding and directing us. There's no guardrails because whatever you want the guardrail to be, if you want the guardrail to be uh, going over the cliff and halfway over the cliff, the guardrail's down there. So maybe it'll catch you. Then that's the way the guardrail can be. Maybe other people want the guardrail to be no guardrail. All right? But without revelation from God, and I believe the revelation from God that we have is in his word. And we miss this a lot, don't we? You talk about why marriages are falling apart in America, I'll tell you. They're not looking at the revelation of God when it comes to marriages. You wanna know why people hate each other? They're not looking at the revelation of God. All right, and I can go on and on and on and on. And so... When we're talking about that, specifically today, I'm going to be talking to you about um, the vision of anticipating that which may, will or may come to be. But I'm going to tell you this, if you're not following the revelation of God and you're not taking small steps of obedience to obey him, your life will just be, eh, it'll be eh, the rest of your life. But I can tell you this, Vision is most valuable. Let's say that together online and in person. Vision is most valuable. You know why? When somebody doesn't have a vision, if they don't see what God wants to do in their life and they don't have anything that they're going to anticipate, they have no hope. We think that vision is only for visionary leaders. That's a lie. You need to have a vision for your life. Uh, in other words, vision and purpose are, 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 are very closely connected together. Somebody that has a vision usually has a purpose. Somebody that usually has a purpose has a vision, but somebody that doesn't have a vision doesn't have a purpose. If I walked into your life right now, and I said, hey, show me where you have it written down. I'll wait. You can go to your house. You can go to your office. Where do you have written down of where you want your life to be in the next five years when it comes to your health, when it comes to your life spiritually, when it comes to your marriage, your kids, your grandparents, I mean, your, well, even with your relationship with your grandparents, your grandkids, wh wh where, where do you want your life to be? And most people, if they were honest, after they fidgeted around a little bit and acted like they're going to try to make up, some would say, I've never thought like that. Yet, isn't it interesting? Aren't you glad that people before us had a vision? Let me help you. Vision takes man to the moon. Does it? Yep. Yeah. Vision makes an airplane being built in a bicycle shop. Uh, that'll never work. You're dumb. Vision makes a man take off from the free throw line. <laughs> 
Vision makes you build a car with no motor that runs on batteries only. Vision makes you build an ark when it hasn't rained. Vision makes you put your baby in a basket when they were killing all of the little male babies and sending him down the river. Vision makes you leave your successful fishing business to follow this man by the name of Jesus. And vision is what caused Jesus to get up on the cross and die for you and I. What is the vision for your life? Because vision brings hope for your life. Vision brings hope for your life until, like the children of Israel, fear becomes bigger than vision. I don't always pick on people, but he's like my son, so I can pick on him. Matt, you knew I was going to pick on you. You could say in the middle, the back, I don't care. Matt started a trash, trash um, company. It's called Ma's Disposal. All right, y'all have grown pretty quick, okay? But here's what happens. And you believe in your business right now, right? right. All right, but here's what happens. I guarantee you, um, I don't care how good you are, you let some fear settle in, you let some big accounts get canceled, and you go from a hero to zero in your mind. And fear will paralyze you. And fear will keep you from thinking like you've been thinking. Right. Now, Matt and Allie are, and their kids, they're, they're in our small group that we meet in every, every Sunday night. And so I know the intricacies of what's going on in their business and their life. And, and God's doing some amazing things. You've had some good vision for that. And I'm really proud of you and your wife and what you guys have accomplished. But here's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that if fear becomes bigger than vision, your trash company and everything that you're doing loses. See, see the, these children of Israel, they became fearful. Everybody say fearful. fearful. Anybody ever been fearful? Yes. And when I become fearful, I overemphasize the negative in my life. Yeah. Children of Israel did this. Look at uh, Numbers chapter 13, verses 27 and 28. And they told him, we came to the land that, to that which you sent us. All right? They brought back a report to Moses. Uh, look at what look at what he says. We came to the land of which you sent us, and it flows with milk and honey, and, and this is its fruit. And they brought fruit back. Moses like, let me taste some of that fruit. However, the people who dwell there in the land are strong. Their cities are fortified, and they're very large people. I mean, like we just look like little people compared to these people. And besides, we saw the descendants of Enoch there. And all they did was start focusing in on the negative. Listen, maybe that's you. Maybe you have, you think, because uh, I hear people brag about this. Well, I, I, see, I, see, I see the negative in life. Listen, if that's the first thing you see, you need to rewire your thinking. The children of Israel, all they saw was negative. Here's what's crazy. God told Moses to go to the land that he was going to give the land to him and the children of Israel. Numbers 13, verse one. The Lord spoke to Moses. The Lord what? Spoke to Moses and gave him revelation saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the people of Israel. So if God said that it's gonna happen, is it gonna happen? Yes. Yep. So there's no need to be afraid. The other thing that happens is I pay too close attention I pay too much attention to what others are doing. This one will get you in trouble all the time. I like social media, can I tell you? And I use it in a very specific way, but can I tell you, I think it's done more harm than it has good. Because if I surveyed you, I can get screen time on your phones. And then if I, could dial, if I could dial in and get somebody who really knows how to check out what's on your phone and see how much time you spend on Facebook and Instagram, and if I could see what accounts, oh no, we don't want to go that deep. 
see who you're comparing yourself to? You start paying too much close attention to what others were doing. The children of Israel went in there and, and God has said, hey, I wanna give you this land. And they had everything that you could ever imagine, but they're like, nah, negative, 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 negative. They, they was like, the people, they're so big. They're large. It's a fortified city. It's, there's no way. We don't deserve that. You know what I tell people? When people go, oh, there's no way I could do that. I'm like, you're absolutely right. With your thinking, you'll never be able to do that. Let me tell you something. We could have the next person that's gonna develop something like Amazon sitting in our congregation today. Why couldn't we? That God created you to do big things for him. He wants you to do like big things for him. Like he wants you to raise children that are going to change their generation. He wants you to raise grandchildren. He wants you to be a husband and wife that loves each other and, and lives out the gospel in front of other people. He wants you to go love people. He wants you to do big things for him. He wants you to start a trash business and commit that to Jesus and people get to see how a young married couple starts raising their kids and, and they have this, this, this Christian company and they run it not like everybody else. How they treat their employees different. But you gotta stop paying attention to what others are doing. Uh, they underestimated the ability, they estimate the abilities God had given them. You know how many times I've done that in my life? I underestimate the abilities God has given me. L look at it, if you don't believe me. Look, Numbers uh, 13, 31. Then the men who had gone up with them said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. Do you think God didn't know that? God knew that. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report. Everybody say bad report of the land that they had spied out saying the land through which we have gone to spy is it out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who come from Nephilim and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. So we seem to them. They just kept comparing themselves against other people. There's no way I could ever do it. And we just, we just, we just, it's the wrong land. I mean, I know we're out here in the wilderness and that's the best land I've ever seen. No way. I just don't have the ability to do it. Do you think like that? Sometimes. And so do I. When I, when I get fearful, I inflict others with my negativity. I see this happen all the time. People just start going around and infecting others with their negativity. And then I make myself miserable. Anybody ever made themselves miserable? Yeah. I have. I can make myself more miserable than anyone else. Anybody with me? Yeah. I'll just keep that negative self-talk going. And then, this is the biggest one, you ready? I underestimate God. When we become fearful, we live day by day just to survive. Many people are existing but not thriving, and God wants you to thrive. But you gotta break out of the box that you put themselves in because if I'm existing in a certain area of my life, that means there is no vision or purpose in that area of my life. And so what I wanna help you see is what Proverbs 29, 18, when people do not accept divine guidance, if you don't wanna accept God's divine guidance and revelation from his word, you're gonna run wild. I've got free will, yes you do. I can do whatever I wanna do, yes you can. But when you do, your life is visionless. You have no revelation, you have nothing to guide you, nothing to direct you, no, no guardrails. And, but the, the scripture says, but whoever obeys the law is what? 
joyful. So you got to develop a vision for your life. So the rest of this service, this worship service is going to be, we're going to work together. You ready? Give me full house lights. I'm going to come down there in a minute because I want to talk to you guys, but I want to help you here. We got to start with the end in mind. Everybody say that with me. Start with the end in mind. So here's what we're going to do. I'm not trying to be morbid, but I want you to pretend as if we are at your funeral service. If you need to close your eyes, you can, or you can keep them open. What do you want people to say about you on that day? When people get up, I've done, I don't even know how many celebrations of life on this stage. And over 32 years of ministry, a lot of celebration of life, and I've been to a lot of funerals. People will say things like, they'll get up and they'll open their letter and they're fidgeting around and they're grasping for words and, well, he was a good man. He was a great man. Listen, the worst thing you could say about me, I do not want you to tell me, I do not want you to tell people that I was a good man or I was a great man. If that is the best impact that I have had on your life, I have failed. But I want you to speak specifically. I have this vision, like, I want you to speak specifically, like, you know what? When Chris came into my life, he showed me who I really was, and that I gained strength and confidence through his Jesus, which became my Jesus. And I started going showing other people, what kind of vision do you have for your life? How many people do you want to be at your celebration of life? How do you want to end? Do you want to have any resources that you give to your kids, your grandkids? What does that look like? I'm going to come down here because I want to help you because some of you are looking at me like, what is he talking about? Okay. So you begin, you begin with the end in mind and here's the big idea. And then we're going to talk this through. Okay. So this is where you're going to want to take out your phones, pen or paper. All right. So take out your phones, take notes. The big idea today is discovering God's vision for your life begins with small steps of obedience in the right direction. I've got to go to God's word and say, God, if I'm wanting to have a great marriage and my marriage sucks right now, I need to take a small step. A small step. I want to help you take a small step and then we're going to kind of tease this out and then we'll talk about this next week. Where do you want to be in five years? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. The work that I'm going to do with you, there are people that get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to walk into an executive's life, to sit down with them and to help them figure this stuff out. A lot of money. Casey, you know that to be true, right? They pay big money to walk in and say, where do you want to be in five years? Now, here's the problem. Some of you, your heart is pounding really fast right now because you're just like, oh my gosh, I don't think I've ever thought beyond the next meal. And he's talking about five years. Where do you want to be in five years? Let me help you. And then we're going to play some music and have you Write out some stuff, okay? And you can choose to sit there and stare around. That's fine. That says a lot about how you participate in life, okay? And you're not going to get anywhere in, in life doing that. Where do you want to be in your health in the next five years? Do you want to have had three heart surgeries? And do you want to be, I mean, I'm not joking. Do you want to be to where you can't barely get around? When your grandkids are born, do you want to get to where you can't even play with them? Where do you want to be in your health in the next five years? Where do you want to be with your relationship with Jesus in the next five years? 
Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be with your job in the next five years? People don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. Where do you want to be in your marriage in the next five years? One of the things I love is um, in May, my wife and I are going to go for our third year in a row that we're going to go to Florida and we're going to go to Indian Rocks, which is right by um, Clearwater. And we're going to spend 10 or 11, 12 days there. And one of the topics that we're going to talk about is where do we want to be? Where do we want to be financially? Where do we want to be? Now, we have chosen to think 10 years out. Um, as I prepared this, I talked to my board of overseers and they're like, yeah, don't do 10 years because <laughs> you'll, you'll paralyze the people. So I backed it. Like, let's just talk about five years. But think about it. I'm, I'm 50, 50 and a half, if you will. I'll be 51 in July. So in five years, I'll be how old? <laughs> Don says I'll be old. <laughs> I'll be 56. but I got time to accomplish some stuff in this world until Jesus takes me home. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to start writing. This is going to be uncomfortable for some of you. Some of you don't even have your phones out. That's fine. It's not my life. It's yours. I want you to spend a couple of minutes and then we're going to close out. Uh, where do you want to be in the next five years? Let's play some music and let's just go through this. If you're young, you ought to take advantage of this. Where do you want to be in the next five years? Where do you want your kids to be in five years? How are you going to help them get there? If you're a manager, an owner of a company, where do you want that company to be in five years? If you're online, I want to encourage you to do this. Where do you want to be mentally in five years? Where do you want to be relationally in five years? If you're single, how can you become that person that somebody would want to marry? Five years. This could be the most important work you've done this year on your life. Keep going. You're doing a good job. Think it through. If you just had a baby, where do you want that baby to be in five years? Your kids are almost out of the house. 
Where do you want to be relationally with them in five years? I'm going to come down there with you and we're going to wrap this up. Okay, let's just fade the music out. No judgment. If that's the first time that you've ever thought or done an exercise like that, raise your hand. Raise your hand, raise your hand. It's okay, no big deal, no judgment. All right, give me some ahas. What are some ahas that you had? Because this can be scary, but yet it can be life-giving, okay? So what are, just shout out an aha or two. This is the way the first service was, and I was like, okay, wow, that must have been really powerful. All right? You thought when you retired, you didn't have to have a goal anymore. And that's how most people, when they retire, die. Do the studies on it. That's a good aha. Right here, bro. All right, some other ahas. Come on, spit them out. Engage with me. You didn't just come to church, you just sat. If you did, you came to the wrong church. <laughs> Give me some ahas. What are some ahas? The other service beat you guys on this. They started like I primed them and then they started. So... I'll take all, yes, just shout it out. VA Say it again. To be a support system. I want to know my wife, my kids, Ooh. Ooh, that's good, to be a support system. Susan. Oh, you're pointing him, okay. She's like, nah, I ain't gonna say anything. I'm behind the computer. All right, someone else, come on. Come on, people, come on. I said alive. You said what? Alive. Alive? alive. Okay, that is a good goal for five years. All right. All right, I, I'm with you. All right, all right. someone else. What, what did you have? Uh, I thought like to be a drug counselor. Like a addict, and like a... Oh, girl, come on, right here. <laughs> come on. Come on. You know what? And hey, what's your name? Lisa. Lisa. Good to meet you. Um, the only thing that's stopping you from becoming a drug counselor is you. Yep. You can do it. Listen to me. You can do it. Everybody say, Lisa, you can do it. Lisa, you can do it. Lisa, you just got to start ta taking some steps. You know how many things in my life I'm doing right now I never thought I could do? A lot. A lot. All right? Give me some other things. Come on, people. Come on. Yes. I want to be sharing the gospel and leading people to Christ on a massive level. Woo! Come on. So you're not just talking about small Oh, come on. All right, come on. Somebody else, give me another one. Come on. Barb. I want to be part of a, um, a team that helps rescue and lead people to Christ. Yeah. Um, yeah. Say it again. Showing your grandkids how to follow Jesus. Someone, come on. This is getting good. I'm priming the pump. Come on. You what? You want to open your own restaurant? Now, Josh, did you know you can do that? Yeah. You know who's standing in the way from you doing that? Uh, me. You got it. So get out of your way. Tell Josh to get out of the way. You got a dream. You got a vision and pursue it, baby. Come on. All right. I better get a discount or some, 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 uh, you know. Priming that. All right, somebody else. Give me some others. Come on. You got one? Oh, you got one. They're, they're pointing at you. I want to be in college to be a chiropractor. You want to be in college to be a chiropractor. 
Check it out. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Dr. Amy, come here. Come here. Come here. Just sit right here. All right. All right. All right. Sit right here. All right. All right. I want you guys to get to know each other because Dr. Amy is... Dr. Amy, no, 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 no. Hey, I'm done. I'm done with church the way we've been doing it. So if you don't like this, whatever. Listen, Dr. Amy had a dream one time of being a chiropractor. Were you scared? I've been scared a lot. You've been scared a lot? And guess what? She is one of the most successful chiropractors in my, she's my chiropractor at Abundant Life Chiropractic. And here's what I'd recommend. If that's your vision, here's what you need to do. You need to ask her to go to coffee or if you don't drink coffee, you know, soda pop or whatever you kids do. Just ask her, hey, hey, can I intern with you for free? Can I watch what you do for free? And guess what? You can put that on your resume and it'll help you get further faster. All right? She You're welcome. Ask now that I know that. I am all, right? all over it. All right? <laughs> Give her a hand. Give her a hand. Here's what I'm telling you. You start thinking about your life in a bigger way than just what am I going to have for a meal today? All right? Let me tell you about successful people that, that are um, very, here's what I've learned because I've been studying about health and fitness and all this. You know, people that are, that, are, that are really healthy and fitness, their diets are very boring. They do the same thing every day. Well, what are you going to have for breakfast? Well, it's going to be three eggs. I'm going to have some yogurt or whatever. I don't know. Or I'm going to, like mine during the week, it's a smoothie with a bunch of fruit and spinach in it and greens and, and, and protein. It's just kind of boring, you know? But here's the deal. I believe in every single one of you, and I believe that the best is yet to come. You got to start following your dreams. Listen to me. I just preached in a congregation in San Diego where the average age, 150 people, the average age was over the age of 80. I met, I told you I met Bill and Betty. I met a lot of other people in their late seventies, early eighties and early nineties. Guess what? And I don't know how these people do it in San Diego, but I'm gonna go down there and figure it out. I'm gonna get me some jeans. I'm gonna put some of their jeans, not, not real jeans. I'm gonna put their jeans in my, cause they did not look their ages. They look like they were in fifties and sixties and they're like eighties and nineties. But guess what? I preached a similar message to this about um, quantum leap. And I looked at each one of them and I meant it. And I had a moment with one of the guys in the congregation. I said, listen, God isn't done with you yet. If your heart's still beating, God isn't done with you yet. God wants to use you. And it was such a powerful, powerful moment. It was a powerful moment. And I want to look in the eyes of every single one of you because I know a lot of you, and that's the cool thing about being a shepherd is you get to know people. Like, God's not done with you yet. God has vision for you. God wants you to do things, but here's the deal. You're gonna have to find out how to be obedient to him in small steps. I was bragging on Melanie Nelson. My, many of you know her. And she started, her and her husband really say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna be in better shape. And they started losing weight. And, and so she started these 5Ks. And she was at a 5K last weekend and she's doing these 5Ks and everything. And I'm just cheering her on because you know what? Now she's doing 5Ks. Now she's talking about 10Ks. But before she wouldn't even talk about walking around the block. Pretty soon a 10K is gonna seem like child's play. Now, a lot of you would be like, oh, there's no way I could do a 5K run 3.1 miles. There's no way I could do a 6K run 6.2 miles or whatever. Yeah, there's no way you can do it with that attitude. You got to get in there and say, I'm going to do this. I can do this. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I have to do. Discovering the big idea, discovering God's vision for your life begins with taking small steps of obedience in the right direction. You need to find areas in your life that you're not following Jesus in. <laughs> find, like in your marriage, husbands, it says, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, I don't know how to do that. Our marriage is a shamble and I'm about ready to give it in and everything. Well, then just take one small step of obedience and just go help your wife clean the house. Well, that doesn't sound real spiritual. How are we gonna get anywhere? I've done that a thousand times. Well, go do it with a different attitude. See, a lot of us take, try to take too big a steps. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Well, I'm gonna lose weight 
and I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast for 40 days and 40 nights, only water. Jesus did it. Yeah, Jesus walked on water too. If you've never fasted, why don't you try fasting one meal? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I'm just saying, let's take some small steps of obedience. Go to God's word, get revelation. And say, oh, oh, there's what I need to do. I need to quit exasperating my kids. Oh, a small step would be quit poking at them. Okay. Oh, I need to love people. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? And so here's, here's what happened. <laughs> Numbers chapter 14, verse 6. Joshua, the two spies that did not agree with the other, how many spies? The, other, the two spies that did not agree with the other, 10 spies. The, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. How do you say that? Jephunneh? I don't know. Doug. Doug. I'll just say it, call it Doug. Just easier, you know. <laughs> Who were among, see, listen. Like when I was in Bible college, I'm like, I can't pronounce half of these words. And there's some people that know how to pronounce all the words. I'm like, I'm just going to be a real dude. Like if I know how to pronounce it, I mean, I'll just try my best. But then we're just going to go with Jeff and I. All right. It's probably how you said it anyways, but who knows. Who were among those who had spied out the, of the land and tore their clothes and said to all of the congregation of Israel, the land which we passed through to spy out, spy it out is an exceedingly what? Good land. Say it with me. It is an exceedingly good land. Hold on. Wait. Were you with the other 10 spies? Yeah. Hold on. They said it wasn't good. Yeah, but we were there and we're telling you it's exceedingly good. It's amazing how you can take two people through the same circumstances and they have two different points of view. I'm telling you, during Quantum Leap, I told you this. It's all about your mindset, baby. Right. I pointed a gal out on our church in the first service. Not pointed out in a bad way, but I talked about Shyla and how Shyla and her husband, I remember it like it was today. Back, I think it was like 2005, 2006, 2007, somewhere in there. I remember I, I baptized them. We dedicated their children. It was in May. She told me, hey, I got a new job at the extended stay. They went home that night. She went to work at 11 o'clock. Her neighbor called her at like 12.05 and said, your house is on fire. There's so many fire trucks here. And, and she drove home and, and um, it chokes me up how I'm talking about it because I was, ended up being there. And her husband and her two kids died. Like she lost her whole family. She lost everything. I went in the next day and was able to, with the fire investigators, to find her wedding ring. That was it. The refrigerator was gone. Everything was gone. The melted frame of the bed was just, it was, it was so hot in there. And I look at Shyla now and think, man, she believes today the best is yet to come. But back then, if you would have asked her and she said it today, she didn't believe the best was yet to come. You could take somebody else to go through that circumstance and they were just coming out of a lifestyle of drugs and stuff and God had redeemed them. But today she said it, the best is yet to come. It's amazing. It's amazing to me how two people can go through the same circumstances and you got these two guys and they came through and said, no, nah, we're telling you and everybody needs to listen up. The whole congregation of Israel, listen up. The land which we pass through to spy out, it is exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Boy, what a mindset. And next week, here's what I want you to do. This week, if you're up for the challenge, I want you to find some time. It's gonna take some work. And I want you to write out your next five years. Where do you wanna be in five years? Where do you want to be living in five years? 
What do you want your savings to be in five years? I want you to talk about money. I want you to talk about your marriage. I want you to talk about, if you're single, um, what that looks like. I want you to talk about your kids and your grandkids. I want you to talk about what do you want your life to be like, okay? In five years. And then next week when you bring it back, we're gonna use that to continue to build on how to build a life where you can say, say it with me, the best is yet to come. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I wonder if you've given up hope. I wonder if you feel like the best is not yet to come. And what I'm hoping today is that you will hear the whisper, the gentle whisper of the Holy Spirit say to you, child, I love you. The best is yet to come. God can use you to do evangelism in big ways. God can use you as a drug counselor. God can use you, young lady, as a chiropractor. God can use you, young man, to start a restaurant for his glory. God can use you for what you want to do. You've got to have a vision. You cannot let your circumstances today stop you from writing that out. Well, I don't have the money right now and I don't see how it's going to happen. I have never seen how the things that I had vision for was going to happen the time that it was going to happen. In fact, I'm scared to death about telling you about our 20-year anniversary vision because it's bigger than me. But if it's bigger than me, it means God has to show up for it to happen. So I'm telling you, if you feel like you're fearful, I'm with you. (laughs) If you feel like you're not worthy, I've been there. If you feel like you'll never amount to much, I've been there. But I'm telling you that if you know Jesus, it can happen. So Jesus, I pray that you would implant in all of us the best is yet to come. You said in Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Our hope comes from you. And I pray that we would start taking small steps of obedience from your word. Maybe some of us just need to read a chapter of Proverbs a day and start taking principles from your word and say, I'm gonna live that out. Just a small step, small step, small step. As we write out our five-year vision and see it come to pass, God, that you would do a work in every single person that's watching online and in person. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said... Amen. I hope you have a great Sunday.